Mythologizing Jesus from Jewish teacher to epic hero with Dennis R. McDonald. You want to check this show out for sure. If you want to see mimesis criticism and direct parallels on showing how the Gospels, especially the synoptics in this case, are borrowing from the Homeric epics and the Greek myths and stories, you're going to want to check out this show. This takes a whole new dynamic to the development of the New Testament. Things that are once again overlooked by Dr. Ehrman. He doesn't even discuss the mimesis criticism and talk about these stories and how they developed these stories from older myths from the Greek world, as well as copying from the Old Testament. Dennis R. McDonald's going to have one heck of a show with me. He really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And if you like this show, don't forget to subscribe, like, Comment your thoughts on the subject matter down below. It helps this channel grow. And ladies and gentlemen, I have a Patreon now for Myth Vision so you can help support the channel. If you want to be initiates, if you want to join the heresies with us, go check out the Patreon down in the description. You guys can start for as little as $3 a month. I really appreciate all the support I can get to help keep this channel growing. Thanks a lot. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I have a treat for you today. Let me tell you, I'm excited. I've been waiting for this uh, episode here for quite some time, and I just recently finished the gentleman's work. So welcome to the show, Dennis R. McDonald. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. I want to get through real quick on a little short bio for everybody so they understand who you are, why this is important. And um, look, guys, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because if I did, I'd just be reading you the Bible. Um, that's how long this guy's got a rap sheet here with what he's dealt with in the academic world and his research. And I don't mean that in a funny way. I mean that seriously. Uh, Dennis R. McDonald received his PhD from Harvard University in 78, 1978. He's taught New Testament, Christian origins at Goshen College. And the ILIF, if I'm pronouncing that correct, School of Theology, and Claremont School of Theology. So uh, he's written many books, just to list a couple that I just finished. Guys, you have got to get this book. I'm not just saying that. I say that all the time, you know, on books. I just finished this. If you want to find any beauty, like really, really search for any lasting beauty from the gospel narratives and really see how wonderful the authors wrote and what they did and how creative they were. Get the mythologizing Jesus from Jewish teacher to epic hero. I finished it last night, went out with a bang, about had a teardrop from my eye. No joke on how wonderful this book was written. Um, he has the Dionysian gospel. Okay. This right here is the fourth gospel and Euripides. Yeah. Look at that guys. All right, from the earliest gospel Q plus to the gospel of Mark, solving the synoptic pro uh, problem with mimesis criticism, which we're going to talk about mimesis criticism today, and Luke and Virgil, imitations of classical Greek literature. Be on the lookout. Check these out. They are down in the description as well as the links to uh, go to his websites and any other information will be down there that uh, Mr. McDonald would like to talk about. If you want, you want me to call you doctor or? Just oh, Dennis is fine, Derek. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll call you Derek too. Yes, sir. I'm fine with that. I have no uh, PhD. So, <laughs> well, thank you for joining me on the program here for sure. No, it's a pleasure. I actually saw you on um, other YouTube channels in the past. I've seen you debate with uh, Dr. Carrier on the historicity. I've seen you uh, discuss this theory uh, to some extent. And I even, one, one thing I loved that uh, Pine Creek, uh, Doug, I really like that guy. He's, he's a really cool guy and he does a, a good service, I think, on uh, talking with Christians and trying to like understand why they believe the way they do and kind of make them challenge. And on that show, he was interviewing you about your Homeric epics in the Gospel of Mark uh, book, which is an older version, I think, of the mythologizing Jesus, Jesus I think. Yeah. Okay. And he asked you about Dr. Ehrman. And he's like, what's up with this guy? Like, did he look at your book? Did he think there's something here? It doesn't sound like he's following uh, Mimesis uh, criticism. No, no, he doesn't. And in fact, uh, I've had, uh, Bart is a friend of mine. Uh, we respect each other's work. Right. But I told him one time, he has to redo everything he says about the Gospels in his 
widespread introduction. Mm. Because if one takes seriously the literary creativity of the gospel authors and their indebtedness, not just to Judaism, but also to the Greco-Roman world, especially its poetry, it is a major paradigm shift in how one views these texts. And he's entirely silent on anything related to it. And by the way, Derek, that's, I don't mean to pick on him. That's characteristic of the discipline generally. Right. And in a, a, the introduction to a gospel synopsis that uses mimesis criticism to reward the gospel authors for being not just scribes, but also real authors and engaging with the major literature of the Greco-Roman world, as well as the Jewish Bible, I have a long section on why it is that my discipline, which I love and have been invested in, is so reluctant to buy into mimesis criticism. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. It's a major player in our definition of paradigm shift. And he talks what it takes in sciences to shift a paradigm from one model to another. And he uses Darwin or Einstein or Newton and so on as ways of describing this phenomenon. And in my view, we are right in the tension point of moving from one paradigm to another. And it's podcasts like what you're presenting and what I've been on before that are going to reach the next generation of scholars who are going to be able to shift the paradigm. It doesn't mean you get rid of paradigms such as Bargermans or uh, others in the field. It's rather you enrich the paradigm by allowing it to account for new uh, information, new discoveries. And I'd like to think I've been involved in the discovery of parallels in classical Greek poetry that otherwise have been ignored or invisible because of the inertia of the biblical scholarship. And we really are, uh, if I could, we are seeing wave after wave of increase in interest in mimesis criticism, but we're not yet at full tide if I could pull it, put it that way. And that's why I so value um, the exposure that you're helping me have with these books because th those paradigms don't shift easily. And sometimes um, I've been the victim of, of hostility. So um, I don't, I understand why people are protective of their own paradigms but uh, they need to account for new kinds of information, the kind that seemed to have been important in your reading, Mythologizing Jesus. You did a beautiful job, and I felt that it was really well done, using Christian, Christian church fathers on just getting this thing started and saying, listen, these guys had the criticisms from the pagan writers. These, the pagan writers knew they know what these stories look like. Everybody who knew anything, who read and spoke Greek, had awareness of who the Homer, Homeric epics were, the Iliad, the Odyssey, et cetera, these different variety of books. And that was one of the attacks was, hey, this is just a ripoff where they're arguing with the Christians. Of course, there's debate. And you said, listen, yeah, yeah, there's definitely that going on. But, you know, this Jesus is better than those. And you're right. When you did your book, it's like, you're actually right. The, the parallels are so obvious in many cases. And in some cases, I will admit, there aren't as strong as par uh, parallels as are in others. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But they're still Absolutely. like, sometimes verbatim, like the woman, oh, I want to get into details. Is that, are we too early to get into details yet? I think bringing up a case first, <laughs> like talking about it is important, but uh, I'm excited about this book, though. So I think it's important. W wouldn't you agree, though, that um, it's it's right there in church father, you know, history that this is an argument taking place that already. Yeah, um, and in fact, the information that I provide in Mythologizing Jesus is literally 
figuratively, the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are major poems that were produced in the Greek-speaking East um, that retold gospel stories by ripping out lines from the Homeric epics to retell them. They're called the Homerocentones. Um, the Gospel of uh, Nicodemus was published in three different moments, one in Greek in the fourth century, one in Latin in the sixth or seventh century, and another in Greek in the ninth century. At each stage, and these are orthodox, at each stage, they're retelling gospel stories by using Homeric or Euripidean poetry. They did not see it as heretical. They saw it as a part of the orthodox interpretation. Now, what happens in the West is people stopped, people stopped um, uh, reading Homer and they or Euripides. So they didn't know these texts. Now, biblical scholarship in the West is indebted to the Western tradition of interpretation much more than the Eastern interpretation. I can give an example of uh, John Chrysostom in a sermon equating a gospel story with something he's read in Iliad, and he expected his, his, his audience to make the illusion. So, you know, you have this stuff going on in wow. the priests in the Eastern tradition. They did not consider it heretical because these gospel authors are not saying my deity is like, say, Dionysus or Heracles or, or Odysseus. They're trying to say he's better. Now, one of the th things that I've tried to champion but have not been very successful is for people to understand that theology is largely social identity construction. And if you're reading the Gospels hoping to find history, you're going to be disappointed. If you read the Gospels interested in knowing how narrative constructs social reality and bonds people together in their environment where you have, say, Homeric deities or you have the Jewish God or whatever, then these texts make theological sense. They're not theological in that they're linked to history in the same way as many people would like. They're, they're linked to history as because historical people wrote them in historical circumstances trying to address social realities. And narrative is a brilliant way of reconstructing and, and founding new social identity. So one of the things I think that the challenge for the next generation is for not to jettison theology, but to understand theology is social identity formation. And it's a creative, wonderful myth vision process. Myth vision. Interesting. I wonder where I got that. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I wrote a few things down and I love what you said there because it's been my recent quest, if you will, my, um, my myth vision quest here on uh, this YouTube channel to try and find the historical Jesus, which I don't want to go there on this show. We can do other shows. I'm very interested in hearing what you've discovered and what, where you go with it because all of the mimesis criticism and stuff, but I just wanted to like point out that I actually entertain all avenues, right? So I allow the mythicist to come in and I have historicists who think he was a rebel leader and then others who say, listen, he was a magician, which I'm going to have uh, Robert Connor on at some time and he's going to come talk about the magician Jesus. And I entertain all of them. I love the idea, the notion. But just recently I had Lane Einhorn, who did a shift in time, show that if you take the Gospels, in any way try to find some history there like references to real people places and things and stuff they took place if you take them that way in the 50s not in the 30s under pontius pilate if you look at josephus so you not only have mimesis criticism but if you do try to find any way where theology separates itself from possible historical any type of reference to something historical they're still not in the right time so it's like ah you got to pull your hair out and say okay guys let's just remember, we're speculating here. So that's all you can do is speculate. And, and I said it at the intro of my, uh, one of my last videos was, guys, I don't know, but it's hard to find what's real and what's not in this theology, or we can call it historical fiction, if you will. Uh, 
it's beautiful though. And when you mentioned the um, the Gospel of uh, Nicodemus, are you referencing in your book here the Byzantine intellectuals that you discuss in the book? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay, that that was really clever. I I wanted to ask you about that because these are believers. These are obviously Orthodox believers who are doing exactly what you're saying. So they're obviously not fundamentalist in the same sense as what right. we see today. Okay. Um, did you want to comment prior to me move into another idea? <laughs> I do, but I want to um, give you an abbreviated version and you're welcome to pursue it if you want to. Please. I think the one thing we know about Jesus is that he was crucified, which is a Roman death. And that he... Um, that probably there were complicities with the Jewish intellectual establishment at the time in getting him crucified. Now, what would get him crucified? I think you can see both in Paul and in the Q document, which I'd like to talk about a little bit later, maybe a different podcast, um, that Jesus in those texts is credited with redefining Jewish law in a way that emphasizes openness and compassion. And uh, in the Q document, is, this is where we find lots of the controversies over the law, Jesus healing on the Sabbath, collecting grain on the Sabbath, I, the famous story of Jesus forgiving a sinful woman, I place in Q, where Jesus is explicitly um, opposing Jewish uh, and Mosaic commandment to kill women like this. And I think what's happened in the Q document is Jesus's compassion and reinterpretation of the law, which I think was historical. You have it in Paul as well, although Paul shifts it in a somewhat different direction, but it's a law-free gospel. Well, where does he get it? He attributes it to the tradition. Logoi of Jesus, or Q, attributes it to Jesus himself and the tradition. I think that was enough to get him in trouble because he's violating um, Torah observance, although he's not jettisoning it, but he's making it responsible in a compassionate way. The author of the Lost Gospel is rewriting Deuteronomy to portray Jesus as the promised prophet like Moses who is changing the law because of compassion. And it appears everywhere in Q. For example, you tie the mint, the cumin, and the dill. You should do those things, but you let the weightier things of the law pass, such as justice and love. So um, the way he's depicted in the Q document is a champion of the kingdom of God and a new understanding of what it means to be Jewish that is compassionate. The Q document, as I understand it says, prostitutes and tax collectors will get into the kingdom of God before you tore observant Pharisees. Now that is, I did not come to call the righteous, I've come to call sinners. So I think we can say that Jesus was not a Christian, but a Jew. He was Torah observant to the extent that the Torah didn't hurt people. But he also was a champion of compassion. Now, what happens in the Synoptic Gospels, in my view, is that that vision of Jesus as the champion of compassion and justice and the outsider gets magnified into the Greco-Roman world. So Jesus is also more compassionate than Odysseus or uh, Achilles. His God is more compassionate than Zeus or Apollo. So, or... Um, and so this notion of Jesus as a champion of justice and compassion has a Jewish side, that is, that Jesus is the new Moses who um, changes law with a, a, an interest in compassion and justice and the outsider. And it happens in the Gospels by having it ex that vision extended to the Greco-Roman world, where Jesus is also more compassionate, just, and he has more divine power, too, than um, the Greek deities. So how do we talk about the fountainhead of such a revolutionary reevaluation of Judaism that is still present in the, to some extent, in the Christian movement today? 
Well, it started somewhere. Paul didn't know Q, Q didn't know Paul. So it's got to be back there, and they're attributing it to Jesus. So I don't think we know precisely anything that Jesus said. But I think it'd be very difficult to craft a Jesus that wasn't responsible for a radical and, for him, lethal reinterpretation of Jewish law. Interesting. I think we could do a show on that where you, you're going into your, your evidences on that. I know some people disregard Q altogether, but um, I'm interested because I, I do interview Dr. Robert and Price often, and Dr. Price does think there's a Q, and he thinks there might be more than one source. So there's like possible, you know, there's a variety of possible ideas going on. You have Q, and then you have Q plus, and then, you know, so you do, you do go into this stuff. Uh, I'm interested in doing shows on those books as well when I, when I can digest all of them because uh, reading is very difficult for me to do with my limited time. I can listen more than I can actually like digest the words, but um, this was such well, a good leave, Derek, before we leave Q, let me just say one more thing. My Please. main project now is a mimetic synopsis of the canonical, of the synoptic gospel, which includes in this order, Mark, Matthew, Luke, but in the first column is my reconstruction of Q. But it's a mimetic synopsis insofar as the literary antecedents to these pericope are, um, they, there's an introduction to the pericope that includes the relevant passages from the Jewish Bible and Greek poetry. I wish I could add Greek philosophy to it, but I can't because of the size of the book. But um, it's intended to be a reference work and it should be available online in a PDF for free. And um, so I'm working with a, a publisher about getting that done because at my age, um, I'm comfortable enough. I don't need the income. I really think exposure to this kind of um, information is more important. For that reason, I'm doing it in English and not in Greek too. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, to get a little more traction on it. Well, you guys hear that. So in any way, shape, or form, go down in the description and help in some way, shape, or form, reach out, do whatever we need to do, go to the links, check it out, be on the lookout for this material because I know that we're going to do more shows down the road where if once you drop it, we're going to end up screaming it from the rooftop so everybody can hear about <laughs> it. Um, one thing that I thought was fascinating about this book I, and I usually reference my own personal journey. So like a lot of things I bring up, some people don't find as interesting as others, but I actually deconstructed from Christianity coming from a position called full preterism, not partial preterism, full preterism is the teaching that the second coming of Jesus literally did happen because he said it would in that generation and that generation would not pass away. You know, we, I was fundamentalist Christian. So you got to kind of like really go over here to get in my brain to try and understand. But nonetheless, the final end, the apocalypse, the resurrection of the dead, everything was supposed to happen in that generation. And the second coming, if you will, his return to bring all things to an end did. The gospel narrative had been preached to the whole world because we would use harmonization and we'd run to Paul. And we'd see Paul. Paul said the gospel had been preached to every creature. The gospel had been preached. The world was turned upside down with this message in Acts and other places that reference it is like already been preached to the whole world. And they're just waiting for the end to happen. Well, I saw in this mimesis criticism that you brought up in here that you took an approach that Homer is, goes to war. He disappears for a while. They're all waiting and hoping he comes back, but they're afraid their 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 guy Homer's not coming back. Yeah, it's not it's not Homer's Odysseus. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Homer's writing of Odysseus. Sorry, scratch that. Uh, Odysseus is going to war with Troy, and he dies. Everyone thinks, okay, as Jesus dies, as most think, and only a few know he ascends. But the narrative is a little different. Nothing's in exact chronological order. However, he's gone for 20 years, and then he comes back but he comes back secretly and you take this interesting parallel to the Homeric epic to Jesus's own claims of a return with that idea of Odysseus's return as well. 
Now, I, I, I don't know if you could probe any on that and comment on the return of Christ Jesus, if you will, and what relevance the gospel narratives do you think have on their eschatology of a return of Jesus? And do you think they literalized this return when the, from, a, from a mimesis criticism and they took a narrative that was not intended necessarily to be the literal return of the Messiah Jesus? It's a very complex idea. And do you have any comment on that? Maybe the, the end of Jesus's return and stuff with the whole criticism here? Well, I think this is one place where Bart Ehrman has done us a service in that to talk about the apocalyptic background of the early church. You find it in Paul, even before the composition of any of the Gospels, including probably the Q document. So Paul it very robustly says that at, early on that he expects to be alive when Jesus returns. And then later in the writings, if we're right about the chronology, he expects that he will die, and those of us, uh, and then um, there will be a resurrection of the dead to meet uh, people, the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. So I think that represents a very early um, apocalyptic vision. Um, the Q document has a somewhat different read on it. It's rather that Jesus dies, people will not see him. And you will, he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That is, he's an absent Lord until he comes back in vindication. And the promise of um, destroying the temple and building another is a part of what Q says. Jesus will come back and destroy the temple. Well, when the temple's destroyed and Jesus didn't come, that creates a crisis. And Mark is the first person to recognize that as a crisis. And so he puts the promise of, I will return and destroy the temple on the mouths of false teachers and others. But he still insists that um, the time is short and this generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. The Odyssean piece of that is that when Jesus comes back, he'll clean, he'll kick butt, the same way that Odysseus kicked butt to the suitors. So you have this possible echo of the Odyssey already in that place. But in the Gospel of Luke, it becomes full force. Namely, when the risen Jesus appears to people going to the road of, to Emmaus, um, he is playing the role of Odysseus, revealing himself to his father, Laertes. And then when he's with the disciples, what does he do? He exposes the wounds on his hands and his feet. What does Odysseus do to demonstrate to his father that he's returned? He shows the wound on his thigh. And this depiction appears in medieval art where you have both the depiction of Jesus of Odysseus revealing his thigh wound, mostly to Eurycleia, his nurse, and the, uh, uh, and the um, woman um, who anoints Jesus for his death, and the depiction of his, uh, Jesus exposing the stigmata. Um, so th th the similarities did not escape ancient artists as far as no. we know, medieval artists. <laughs> so you have, be, you're quite right that Odysseus returning in secret and putting his house back into order was a very attractive model for a number of early Christians who were expecting Jesus to return. And I mean, you, you go into the book and you show these things in ways I've, I would have never, but then again, I'm not well read on these stories. So I really, really should, re now you make me want to read the actual stories, the source material and read these. because well, You'll enjoy it so much. Really. Uh, I love the end of the book. You ask your, uh, your grandchild, you know, you, you spend a week reading from the gospels of Jesus. And then you read from the Homeric epics. And at the end, you're like, so which one do you like more? And he's like, the Greek one better. And you're like, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. But uh, 
one thing you mentioned um, in this temple idea where Jesus comes in and starts flipping over the tables, right? Money changer tables. Um, a lot of people take that like full force. And I mean, I guess there was cleansing of the temple situations with like Judah the Galilean and others in history. So they took, like you said, this weird blend of things that may have actually occurred in some sense and created a fictional historical fiction do you buy that that literally happened that there was a guy who actually flipped money changers named Jesus? Or do you think that plays more mimesis than it does in any real history? That's a brilliant question, Derek. And I want to parse it out for you. Okay. It's one thing to make a comparative literary judgment. It's quite another to make a historical judgment. Then the question is, because they're both legitimate enterprises, which one trumps the other? Sorry to use the T word. Um, <laughs> but the, the way I would start answer the question is in three ways. First of all, we don't have historical information. We have a text. And the text itself can be compared with other texts. And we can have a sense of how much an, an author was influenced by the antecedent text. That's not a historical judgment. It's not a judgment against the historicity, but it starts with what we have. It compares it with other things we have. The next question is to say, what is there about the text that doesn't, can't be explained by the known literary models? And there are some things, for example, the temple or money changers in the temple and so on. So you have what one might call transforms. Um, where an author is indebted. I mean, obviously, Homer didn't um, concoct Jesus. He didn't concoct the Jewish temple, and so on. So you have residual historical information. Now, that can mean it's a historical novel, or it can mean there's residual historical information. I think the other is the question of plausibility. Does the narrative ring true to some extent? And uh, in this case, even though I think the author is heavily indebted to, to Odysseus cleaning house and turning the tables and, and vessels, and, and I can give more evidence for it, that doesn't mean that the event didn't take place. And you have to explain why it is that this Galilean was crucified in Jerusalem because he was a troublemaker. He made trouble of some kind. And this narrative may be a way of um, putting a narrative together to make it make sense. So I think it's plausible. There's nothing miraculous about it. And in fact, one could say it's somewhat embarrassing that a teacher of nonviolence goes and, you know, uh, and is like this. Now, did something like that happen? I think that's quite possible. Is it um, did it happen that way? I would say it's highly improbable. But that doesn't mean that the story is useless. And I'll tell you why I think it's not interculturally useless. When Odysseus comes home and, and kicks butt, he kills his opponents. Nobody is harmed when Jesus cleans the temple, except maybe the doves. I don't know. He didn't hear about the doves. <laughs> but, um, but he is purging the temple and accuses the, the temple of being the place where uh, oppression takes place. So even if one were to stay with the narrative over against the Homeric narrative, Jesus is relatively nonviolent. The humans aren't, aren't harmed. Yeah, and one thing that comes to mind is another possible or possibility, if you will, is that they are maybe using josephus in his histories to some extent possibly that could be something that they could be using and taking reference of ideas that might be pertinent or relevant to them and say hey this guy cleansed the temple the temple was a big problem let's use a narrative and add this to it uh I, i've thought about that myself like the woe saying jesus when we go to josephus and i know this is outside of mimesis we'll come right back to that just just something interesting where you have jesus ben ananias the woe saying jesus being in the mouthpiece of Jesus from the Gospels. So it makes you kind of go, well, they could be using Josephus, 
even if it didn't literally happen that Jesus flipped over money changers, we know there were people who were rebels and such that were in that time. That doesn't mean Jesus was one either. They could just be using this reference. But I like how you showed Odysseus com- coming back, and once they find out it's him, it's on. And he takes them all out. His son, he's telling him, shh. The woman who's, you know, who actually he was breastfed as a child. Um, and he's like, woman grabs her by the throat. Listen, don't tell anybody. What was her name again? That was an interesting. Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. And when um, the woman recognizes Jesus in anointing his head, he says what she has done will be known far and wide wherever the gospel is preached. That can't be an accident. And in fact, um, the Byzantine um, poets, in retelling that story, use that expression. She, uh, what this woman did for Jesus will be known far and wide. <laughs> and, you know, they, they see this stuff, we don't. The, the one thing about Josephus is we have literary problems with Josephus too, not mm-hmm. just the gospel. And um, I think a good case can be made. In fact, I would support the case that Luke, writing early in the century, second century, could have known the writings of Josephus. I think it's more likely that the experience that Josephus himself had in the Jewish war wasn't just his experience. It was a part of what was going on historically. And the author of the Gospel of Mark almost certainly knows something about what happened during the Jewish War. So at that point, I doubt if it's direct literary inter, um, connection. Right. It could be they're reflecting on pivotal and iconic and tragic moments in the war independently. That's a good point. I mean, it, that could be the case. That could be very well the case there. They know too much, in my opinion, to not know the war already happened and what's already taken place. But uh, I, I wrote down, um, let's see. So I had something, and I started piggybacking off this methodology. You bring seven points. I think those seven points are vital in expressing why the scientific approach of mimesis criticism is important. And um, – I wanted to mention one thing, and then maybe we can get into those seven points. When you talked about Heracles, which we jumped out of Homer's writing here, and uh, the and I always mispronounce this. Is it the Aeneid? The Aeneid. The Aeneid. I always mispronounce it. Um, and Heracles is taking Cerberus, this three-headed dog beast, down to uh, Hades. Um, and you paralleled that around the same time that Jesus is – approaching the Mount of Transfiguration. It was so beautiful. One of the things I had to write down, and I usually don't write in books while I write when I'm reading, but I had to. I was like, I have to write this down, so I'm writing in the actual book. And I said, okay, three-headed dog, do you see a parallel with the James, John, and uh, or James, Peter, and John coming on the mountain as the three heads of Cerberus in any way, possibly paralleling the the narrative? Uh, No. Um, not okay. until you said it. Never occurred to me. Um, but just just a, a modest footnote. That story is the only place where the Gospel of Mark is imitating Greek poetry other than Homeric poetry. He's imitating madness of Euripides by Euripides. Right. And, um, and that story is so clear. The, the parallels are so smashing that um, you can hardly deny. Uh, now, again, a literary judgment is not the same as a historical judgment. So did Jesus exorcise? My assumption is that he did, Okay. Um, that he was an exorcist. So these stories are elaborations on, and beautiful elaborations on the, the exorcism, like the, the garrison demoniac. Sorry. <laughs> no, not like the garrison demoniac. Um, no, I hadn't thought about that. Well, I, I was picking up on how you were approaching this literary idea, and I said, hmm, let me, um, let me see if there's a connection here. Because the first thing I thought when I saw that the Cerberus was being taken to Hades, of course, it's strange that, you know, obviously in the, in the Mount of Transfiguration, he's not taking them to Hades. He's taking them on a mountain. But 
Um, uh, it is interesting. Either you could play the role of, and, and this one didn't work as good as Peter, James, and John coming, but you had Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, which is three as well. So, right. but, but what confused me is in, you know, in the narrative, Heracles is separated from three headed beasts. So I don't know how meticulous, but I thought about the three and I thought about the three heads and I said, Hmm, maybe there's something there as well. Maybe they just had to have three characters come with him because there's a three headed beast. I don't know. But I, I did like the, the idea that what was the name of the God that got Her- Heracles uh, possessed? Um, well, Hera, um, is always jealous of Heracles because her husband Zeus slept with Leda to um, uh, Alc- uh, Alcmene in order to uh, sire uh, Heracles. So she was always after him. And she sent um, a demon called Lyssa, namely Madness, to strike him dead, uh, to strike him mad. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's. Let me let me come back to your imagine that you're thinking about Cerberus and the three and so Please. on. Because I think it's important. The and here I want to talk about what it means to be left brain and right brain and how to manage that. Your imagination, the right brain piece of it is really important. And I think so many readers of the Bible are not imaginative and they don't understand the playfulness of this literature. So you're really to be commended on the imagination piece. Now, of course, imagination also needs to be disciplined. So that's the left brain. And so the question is then, what kind of criteria can we use to make sure that we're not, that our imagination is really saying something about the text and not something about what we had for breakfast or last night drinking or something like that. So that actually is not a bad segue to the criteria of mimesis criticism, because it's one thing to have a rich imagination, as clearly you do, but it's quite another to kind of put that insight into the bank. If I mm-hmm. absolutely that. and I'm say, okay, how do we how do we discipline that? Now the criteria are not foolproof litmus tests; they're rather considerations. Um, that if you didn't have any of those criteria met, then you don't have mimesis. But you don't have to have all of them, right? And um, so th- there are actually, I think. Intuitive. Is this okay to talk about uh, the criteria now then? Yeah, yeah, if you'd like. Yeah, and I was going to say, I have the book up. You have seven um, that you you are, you know, trying to do the left brain. Like, these are rules we should stick with. Not saying there's stuff that doesn't go outside of this. Yeah, that's right. You can't be certain. And I think that's what you're trying to say is, look, look, guys, we can be imaginative. We can guess. Like I just did with Cerberus, okay? It's a fun exercise, but you do more than that in this book. I want everyone to know this is not a, just a playful, imaginary thing. This You're literally taking literary construction. Do, well, do you want to go ahead and take over? Do you want me to read off some of these criteria or? Uh, go ahead. Okay. So here are the criteria of when we're approaching Mimesis uh, cr- criticism. So uh, number one, the criterion of accessibility pertains to the likelihood that the author of the later text had access to the putative model. So would it be, in, in simple terms, is this uh, text something that people have? Is this something that they probably were reading or were influenced by possibly? Right. Let me give you an analogy for the Hebrew Bible. Okay. If I were to say that this is an imitation of Deuteronomy or the Psalter, that would be, it magnificently satisfies the, the, this criterion of accessibility because we have a Qumran, so many copies of Deuteronomy and the Psalter. If we were to say that this is an allusion to Amos or Joel, we would have a big problem because those texts were not widely known in antiquity. And as far as we know, they were never imitated. So um, the same thing happens with the Greco-Roman world. 
if we have certain texts that are widespread and used in education, um, they're more likely to be appealed to in a, in a text and transformed than something that is scarcely known. And this is one of the beefs I have with my field. No Greek texts were more widely used in education or available in antiquity than the Homeric epics. Let me give you an example. We have 800 copies uh, or fragments of copies uh, of the Homeric epics between 200 BCE and 200 AD. For the same period for the Septuagint, the Jewish Bible, total, we have five fragments and there are only fragments. We don't have a complete text. So if we want to know what was available in the ancient world, that's what it was. What Latin texts was what most widely used? Virgil's Aeneid. In the Anchor Bible, six volumes, yep. In the Anchor Bible, six volumes, you have no entry for Homer, no entry for Euripides, no entry for Greek poetry, no entry for Latin poetry no entry for Aeneas. And the Aeneid is the most important, the foundational document for the Roman Empire. Think of it. And it's written uh, in 19, it, it was uh, circulated already before the death of Jesus. It was widespread. We have a copy of it in the backpack of a Roman soldier who was sacking Jerusalem. So, you know, this is how important these texts were. Wow. But in the, in the discipline, they are invisible. One more example. We have, at the end of a, the Nestle says, uh, uh, um, the, uh, 27, 28, we have a big index of, biblical, of uh, ancient citations. We have 3,000 related to the Bible. We have five related to Greek literature only two from poetry. It is an intentional amnesia of the field and it's got to change. This is, this is the, the, the paradigm shift that I'm hoping can happen. That we have been really delinquent in paying attention to the cultural literary world of the New Testament. Mm. This, that's that. I love how you put that because I've even told people, and, and this is off this topic particularly, um, but, you know, I've thought to myself, uh, I, I suspect if you go back in time to the Osiris myths, I wonder how much we've really lost, how widespread, because Egypt had such influence on so many cultures and so many, you know, surrounding uh, places and, and even the Canaanites, you know, you name it. I suspect, even though it was probably there were no books written, I wonder if there were texts or even tablets or the uh, clay tablets and stuff that may be widespread more than what we we obviously have. We have a lack of evidence, but I suspect it was probably widespread to them in some sense. Or the Sumerian myths. Who knows how much evidence we've lost? But we have evidence of how important these things are in the time, which is so important. With your step one here, in the time, which I hear a lot of people when they debate which is an interesting one, uh, on dying and rising God comparisons, okay? I do think there are some. Um, but what they do is they go, what was contemporaneous? You can't use Osiris, that's 2,000-year-old you know, story. How relevant was the Osiris mythology in the first century? Dr. Price suggests very relevant in many ways, especially in mystery schools. So, um, you know, there's just, depending on who you talk to, you can't get around what you're saying here about these these Greek uh, texts. And then looking at the Gospels, which people like to try and completely hone in on the Jewishness of them. They literally try to like remove them like they're unique and special in such a way that they are not tampered with by any outside influence other than this is just a continuity of the Old Testament. And I'm like, you guys should read this book. You want me to give them number two? Yeah analogy likewise pertains to the popularity of the target it seeks to know if other authors imitated the same proposed literary model can you can you uh, elaborate yeah well with with homer we know people were imitating it all the time including virgil 
um, whom I mentioned before in the Aeneid, but we have other examples, Lucian of Samosata, and I mean, it really is all over the place. Um, whereas some other models that have been proposed um, as intertext uh, are not nearly as popular um, as mimetic targets. Simple, I agree. And what he's suggesting here is that the Gospels are another one. All right. The, the synoptics, for sure. Density, simply state, and also, sorry, let me phrase that, even John. Well, you've got that, the Dionysian gospel there, so got to get that book. De uh, density, simply stated, the more parallels one can posit between two texts, the stronger the case that they issue from a literary connection. And this is where I guess that the people like to say, uh, parallelomania, you're just trying to put stuff there and Mm, no, no, read the book. I think it's important because the charts, you don't just say it in literary format and you don't just show it in paragraph format by explaining. You finally go to the end and go, in case you're like me, here's the one, dummies, you know, 101 for me. It's like, here you go, right? Here's the passage, here's the passage, and you get the gist. And um, Well, I would say that there is a danger to parallelomania. So, yes. Okay, there's also a danger to parallelophobia. <laughs> oh man please please i hope people can uh find i guess a balance there and um i don't think you did that in this in this book i think there were cases that weren't as strong as others maybe but Absolutely. but uh there were some that it was so obvious the light bulb went off and i just smiled i was like ah that's so beautiful like how they did that that was such a good clever trick the criteria number four the criterion of order examines the relative sequencing of similarities in the two works. If parallels appear in the same order, the case strengthens for a genetic connection. I think everybody kind of gets the gist of that is, yeah. you know, if Jesus walks up a hill and then Odysseus walks up a hill, he yells at a woman named, uh, named far and wide, let's just say, and Odysseus yells at a woman um, and says, you will go far and wide with this message or something. You see sequential order to this parallel. It's obvious it strengthens. And you do that a lot in the whole, actually the whole book does that, you know, showing there's a sequence in the narrative. But, but one thing I will say for anyone who's, you know, skeptical of this position, and maybe you can elaborate on this for this step number four, is as much as the actual narrative itself in that area is sequential, it's not like, Matthew or Mark chapter one, uh, you know, all the way to the end is literally the Odysseus story in chapter one, all the way to the end of that book. They're, they're out of order in that sense, correct? Exactly. Yep. So they pick and choose where they, they chose to use their stuff, just like they did with the Heracles narrative. Um, and, just, and just like um, and, uh, Virgil does with the Aeneid. Um, yeah, he's not sequential for the episodes. Yeah. See, and it, I don't think that needs to be. Uh, that's, and, but I will say this before we move on. That is the kind of evidence that Christians will demand of us. They will go, oh, nope, sorry, nice try, buckaroo. You got to prove that it's, and I'm like, well, you know, I guess they're waiting for me to find a Greek, you know, book that just says, uh, you know, hi, uh, we're borrowing from, <laughs> you know, like, or something that says it, like it comes down and makes it easy. Well, how much fun would that be? It wouldn't be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Five, a distinctive trait is anything unusual in both the targeted model and the proposed borrower that links the two into a special relationship. Can you give us something on that? Yes. I mean, the, these authors in some cases we're disguising their imitations. But if they are theologically or religiously significant, they want the reader to know that they're rewriting the antecedent. And these are sometimes called medic flags. That, and not just by me, but uh, where authors no longer are occulting their relationship to an antitext, but they're advertising it. And they do so with special vocabulary. They often do it with significant names. They sometimes do it with shared uh, geographical locations. 
And so um, these distinctive traits are quite important. Now, you talked about our friends, evangelical defenders of the faith and so on, would say, well, why, why is there so much different vocabulary? Because the Greek of the New Testament and the Greek of Homer is so different. If we were able to see the analogies, we'd actually see that um, if we were able to make transforms from Homeric Greek into Koine Greek, we see many more parallels. And I try to do this, some of that in my more esoteric work where I deal with the Greek text and so on. So there's more of that, but it's um, very much like reading a novel or going to a movie and you see something that evokes Star Trek or uh, something that you're, you know, is a cultural icon and uh, gives you pleasure, then it wouldn't be as much pleasure if somebody said, oh, remember Star Trek? So, uh, <laughs> so, so these are distinctive bits. I was going to say, can you give us one example, uh, like an example of it that, that, that you go into here? Obviously, you do some of this in your book. Can you give us one example of that with Jesus and then the uh, Homeric epic? Uh, let me give you an example in the Acts of the Apostles, which Perfect. is really quite clear. There's a young man named Eutychus who uh, is listening to Paul preach. He falls asleep, he falls and dies, but his soul stays in him. Paul goes back and preaches until morning and then leaves. And as he's leaving, people get a Eutychus come up alive. There's a story in Homer about an Elpanor who's a young man who gets drunk at Circe's uh, home, falls, he's trying to sleep off his uh, stupor uh, on her roof, falls and breaks his neck and dies, goes and meets uh, Odysseus in the netherworld, and Odysseus agrees to go back and to bury his body amid uh, cries uh, at dawn. And um, Odysseus calls him Dustinus El Penor, unfortunate El Penor, because he survives the Trojan War and then dies on a drunk. <laughs> um, what, is, what does the name Eutychus mean? It means lucky. Eutychus in Greek means lucky. Mm. He's lucky because he dies in the presence of Paul, whereas uh, El Penor, and by the way, his, his, his name means want to be a man. He, he hopes to be a man, but he's not. He's, he's a weakling. Um, those, those, those are things that would just shout out to you. Virgil imitates that story three times in the Indian. So um, that would be, wow. it's outside of the Gospels, but it's a very good example of this uh, advertised nemesis. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Price recently uh, had him on, and he kind of, uh, he actually read uh, from, I believe it was Euripides the Bacchae. I don't know if you're pronouncing that right, Bacchae or Bacchae. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was reading directly from Dionysus and, um, you know, referencing it to the the Acts of the Apostles, as well as Second Maccabees that was used in the Acts of the Apostles. So there's more than one source. Of course, these guys are using many sources. Very clever. But um, I, yeah. I like what you said. There. That's interesting. We'll go to step uh, five or. Six. Yeah, no, six. Uh, interpret interpretability assesses what, if anything, might be gained by viewing one text as a debtor to another. As often as not, ancient authors emulated their antecedents to rival them, whether in style, philosophical adequacy, persuasiveness, or religious perspective. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can't tell why an author would do it. Maybe they were just looking for a good story. But in so many cases, Jesus comes off smelling a lot better than uh, Heracles or Odysseus and so on. So that there's a theological advantage to portraying Jesus in a more positive light. That's all. And, you know, on that note, I, I have to mention your grandson that you're reading this to and paralleling him, even though they did a fine job of showing that Jesus is a better version, um, it's still funny that he thinks that the Greek stories are better because <laughs> it's like, yeah, they might have tried to one up, but at the cost of maybe some of the narrative not quite being as 
uh, more dramatic in a lot of different ways. So you probably lose some sense of interesting things that the original authors had for the Gospels to pretty much probably sacrifice some of that at the cost of, well, we got to have our Messiah, our Jesus, be the be the, the one. He's got to be the well, champ. Let, let me continue that discussion, though. Please, please. Was actually, my son, not my grandson. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. With my son. And then I said, but which story is a better one to live by? The Bible story or the Homeric story? And he said the Bible story. Yeah. So that's what the authors wanted. They wanted to say, it's much better to be compassionate and not to kill your opponents uh, than it is to, um, to kill them. Or, um, or to be duplicitous or whatever. So the authors want the reader to see uh, Jesus as a morally superior um, hero than uh, the Greek. But you can't compete with the Greeks. Even in, even in antiquity, authors knew they couldn't compete. <laughs> well, you, you came out of the book toward the end. Um, you did an interesting thing talking about... Um, uh, you discussed uh, Romulus and his ascension to Jesus' ascension, okay, and showing an interesting parallel there, which I find fascinating. And I've had other guys come on my show. There are other authors that bring some fascinating things about how Rome was about peace, mercy, um, and also the idea that forgiving your enemies, Julius Caesar had an interesting aspect. And so this does not pertain to this book particularly, but it's interesting if one wants to think maybe some of these rules might might apply here where they do have a mimic, uh, you know, if there is some type of um, synchronistic ideas going on or synchronicities, they're trying to syncretize the, the cultures maybe in some way in these books, the Gospels, or in the narrative of the New Testament, they could be using something from maybe uh, Julius Caesar's uh, or the Romans uh, ideas because they're doing it with the Greeks for sure. Uh, on the Caesars, just just throwing it out there. Well, no, you can see this in Luke's infancy narrative. The uh, shepherds are addressed by a heavenly army of angels who pronounce pox on all of goodwill. And this is a uh, an image that is borrowed from the Roman world, where you have an army that is trying to give pox. When Augustine, four centuries later, is, well, three centuries after Luke, is uh, writing his City of God, he makes an argument that the Christian movement w better exemplified the values of the Roman Empire than the Roman Empire did, because of it actually did bring peace. It did, it did love its enemies. And so that the rhetoric of empire, such as you find in Virgil, before Augustine is better satisfied by members of the kingdom of God. Ooh, I'll caught that. All right. All right. <laughs> Number seven often, or let me read before that. You said, I applied these six criteria in my previous publications, the gospels and Homer and Luke and Virgil employ yet another that pertains primarily to the gospel narratives. And that is seven often Greek readers prior to 1000 CE were aware of affinities between New Testament narratives and their putative classical Greek models, such as ancient and Byzantine recognitions often suggest imitations in the original composition of the gospels, which I think you already mentioned. Uh, yes. These uh, Byzantine intellectuals were not embarrassed about extending the biblical narrative by imitating Homer or Euripides on their own. These are the Homeric and Tones. These are the three editions of the Gospel of Nicodemus. They include um, the Christus Patiens, which is a little after uh, a thousand, um, and um, certainly the paraphrase of the Gospel of John by Nonus of Panopolis. So you, um, this enterprise of interpreting the Gospels against Greek poetry and its Homers and, and its mythologies is not unorthodox and it's not absent in the history of interpretation. It's just absent in the history of interpretation in the West, including Europe and North America now. Hmm. That's, uh, <laughs> that makes me want to go back and really read and find out more about some of these differences between the churches. Cause I think we have the Eastern Orthodox and then we had the Roman Catholics. And I think there's a huge difference or am I mistaken in, in terms of understanding these two different 
trains of thought that broke off when the when the the empire split here um do you do you think that uh, you're saying the eastern side took more of this and the western side is taking well, a different and we can, and, and we certainly can understand it so for example in the west the aeneid became very important it was written in latin the church fathers were uh, in the west were latin and you can see it in Dante's Inferno, where in fact Virgil is the visit, you know, initiates the visit to the netherworld. He's the guide. And so you're much more likely to find influence of Latin poetry than you are Greek poetry, simply because that was the, the uh, lingua franca of the West. Whereas in the East, they were much more interested in Homer and Euripides. This is, uh, anyone who's watching has made it this far, Get the book. It's a really good book. Um, and the examples, I almost feel like we're going to cover the whole book by the time we get done with this episode. And I, I'm not really, but there's so many um, stories here that parallel. And maybe we can give a few examples um, prior to to ending this discussion, just for our audience. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I'm running out of battery. Uh, oh, are you? Oh, so uh, let's take one and then let's do this again. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, check out the description. Get uh, these books for sure and be on the lookout for another future podcast where we will go into more information on these other books. And thank you for joining me. Well, I think your listeners should know that your first name in Hebrew means path. And I think you're, you're setting us on a path of exploration. Thanks, Derek. Thank you so much. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are MythVision.